Hollander, who's based at the Tyneside Cinema. Now, Helena is going to chat with him to find out more. Right. In 2017, Tyneside Cinema celebrated its 80th birthday. And Alex, you were chosen to direct the documentary film, The Dream Palace, celebrating the cinema's unique heritage. Uh, could you run through how the project started and uh, how it developed into a film? Absolutely. Well, I've been, uh, I've been based at Tyneside for about six years now, full-time as a filmmaker. And last year, as you say, we celebrated our 80th anniversary. Um, and Ian Fenton, who's my, my boss at the cinema, who's been my, uh, my mentor there for the last, the last six or seven years, um, he's the creative director of the Linden Participation uh, Department. And he, uh, he had the idea of embarking on a, a year-long or year-plus long project. Uh, which celebrated the uh, the eightieth anniversary of the Tyneside, but also celebrated a wider history of cinema going in the northeast and as it turned out in countrywide nationwide and internationally as well um, so we put a bid into heritage lottery fund we were very uh, very lucky to have got that bid um, and the project itself obviously the outcome of the project was a feature length documentary film, but it was a year long project that um, saw us embark on uh, numerous workshops around around the city and further afield and collect uh, contributions from people um, across the entire country and, and further afield. Uh, people sent us clips, uh, they sent us cinema memories of both the Tyneside and other cinemas across the city and the country and the world. Uh, and we, uh, at the end of all this, we compiled, uh, we compiled it all together uh, into, a, into a feature length documentary film. Yeah, what I found interesting, because I did go and see the film, uh, was that you engaged celebrities and people in the community and you captured their personal stories and this nostalgia of cinema going. Absolutely. I mean, the, the celebrities, as you put it, the, um, the, the more kind of known figures in the film were all people with, uh, were all, were all people with a connection to the Tyneside. So, um, so Ken Loach features in the film. Um, he's obviously a very known British director, uh, but he had a connection to, to Nina Hibben, who was a former uh, director of the cinema. Um, she'd been a big supporter of his film, Kess. Uh, and Andrea Riseborough, who's a, an actor, um, uh, she a um, Hollywood actor now, uh, she's a patron of the cinema. Right, well, let's listen to an excerpt from the film because this includes some personal and nostalgic anecdotes um, about cinema going. When cinema came along, what people, the first thing that hit them was how big it was, how it was bigger than life. And then, you know, when you think of, I don't know, an Elizabeth Taylor film of the 1950s, if she sheds a tear, that tear might fall a meter. Before cinema, there was very little in human culture that was that big. We had a, a big, you know, grand old cinema. It was a, quite an experience to go to it, um, not least because all the adults around me when I was a kid referred to it as the flea pit. Pretty grotty, to say the least, and seats used to kind of wobble as you sat in them. Uh, but that's where we went. It was the local one at the time, and we, we used to go most weekends and see what was on. And of course, when you were at school and 14, you wanted to sneak in and see the X-rated ones, you know, and try to be older than you were. Hey, you know, we all did it. To get in on a Saturday afternoon, um, you took a jam jar, and you were given an orange when you got in. You know, one lad would go in and pay the fare or take the jam jar, but then he would go down the fire escape and open the door and let all his mates come in for nothing. It cost a penny to get in in 1972, um, to go to the cinema in 1972, and there will have been upwards of two to three hundred under ten year olds in there, and the only adults we were ever aware of were usherettes, which they were then, they were all female, there were no males, and there were two of them with a little box with a light on, coming around selling you ice cream. And then the organ would start playing, and rise slowly out of the, out of the pit, up, up, and we would be singing, um, we come along on Saturday morning, greeting everybody with a smile. We come along on Saturday morning, knowing that it's quite worthwhile. As members of the Orgy Club, we all intend to be good citizens when we grow up and jump. My grandma was an usherette and she sold um, ice creams in the cinema. And so my dad used to watch every night and fall asleep and then at about 11 o'clock he watched Casablanca like, you know, 12 times a week. 
and then at 11 o'clock she'd carry him home and you'd go to school the next morning. And then there was always the, the interval and the El Dorado lady with the ice cream. And that was what I was going to do when I left school, be an El Dorado lady. But that didn't happen. My first job was uh, the Saturday morning usherette for the kids' matinee. And I used to have to hold the Kiora tray and lead the kind of chorus of happy birthday whenever there was a kid's birthday. And that was my illustrious start of my career. When I got a bit older and became a teenager, I would go with people out of my youth club. And we would go in um, when the first half had started and we'd sit there. And then when the movie had finished, we'd move to the back and sit in the double seats with the boys. I always remember my earliest experience of a cinema was the green face of the witch in The Wizard of Oz. That is the one thing I remember from early cinema, uh, and, and you, you know, you never forgot that. I remember my mum taking me once to see it, because Rock Hudson was in this wonderful film that she wanted to see, and unfortunately there were so many holes in the screen, every time his face came into the middle there was just a hole, I couldn't see him at all. At the Palace Cinema they were showing uh, Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. On the Monday evening I saw it with the money which my mother had given me and on the Tuesday evening I saw it with money that my Aunt Bella had given me and on the Wednesday evening I stood outside the cinema and begged for the uh, six or seven pit pence that I needed so that I, could, I saw it on each of its three showings and I remember it pretty well. Yeah, those were really magic moments. Uh, you must have enjoyed listening uh, to all those uh, memories. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, life has changed so much, hasn't it? Cinema is not the same. Look, we went through those golden years of cinema. It is, it is, it is, but I think um, I think, I think there is this Mark Cousins who you hear there, uh, the voice at the start of that clip, I think he he has a very strong firm belief uh, that that cinema's golden age isn't over; it's only just beginning, and it's it's hard not to when you when you've gone through a project like this. It's hard not to kind of have a bit of belief that there is there is the best is still to come mm. from it. I think. Well, the Tyneside Cinema is Newcastle's only full-time independent cultural cinema, and uh, it's still going strong after 18, uh, 80 years. How do you explain the success? Oh, that's a it's a great question. I mean, I think I think through through I. There was a, there's a lot of very key figures who've uh, who've stood at the helm of the Tyneside uh, through its 80 years. It was opened by a gentleman called Dixon Scott of, uh, of the Scott family, who um, his, his great uncle of uh, film directors Tony and, and Ridley Scott, um, and he was kind of a very uh, a very prominent innovator of the time, a local a local entrepreneur. Um, and since then, since he kind of originally opened it, the film has kind of gone from. From from director to director, very these very strong personalities mm -hmm. who've kept the kept the building open and found ways to to innovate the building, and make it something different, and apply their their trade to it. Um, I think I think it's the city needs a cultural venue like that. I think the city needs something that that is out sits outside of the mainstream, and I think an independent cinema, an independent venue like that, an arts an arts venue like that, um, is it is it important to the to the cultural growth of a city yeah, like well, Newcastle. I'm a member of uh, the Tyneside yeah. Cinema and I feel it's just like a community hub. Absolutely. Uh, it's social, we meet up and also there are so many foreign films that are mm -hmm. shown there that you wouldn't be able to see anywhere else in the city. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, now, I understand the film I, uh, will tour regionally and uh, be entered in film festivals, is that y right? Yes, I mean, we're kind of just off the, off the back of, of the screenings that we've had at Tyneside and we had a big celebratory screening um, of, of the film where we had a lot of, uh, lot of VIP guests come. Um, it, fantastic feedback off the back of that. And, uh, and and now we're just kind of in the process of what comes next. Really, there's a lot of archiving to be done, as it was a lottery-funded project, uh, and there's a lot of there's a lot of planning where where else we'll show the film. Mm. Will it end up in Cannes? <laughs> one, one may wish, but I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, well let's just have a break now and uh, listen to some music. What have you chosen? Uh, I've chosen uh, "Growing Up" by Bruce Springsteen, which is the track from his first album, uh, "Greetings from Asbury Park." Does it have any special meaning for you? Uh, only that me and Ian producer of the film have discussed uh, are both huge fans of Bruce and uh, see this as my first feature film as this 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 film is my greetings from Asbury Park it's putting everything putting everything I've got into a first into a first endeavor um, not knowing if there'll be a second one this is for you 